Well, welcome the Office of Programs to Enhance Neuroscience Workforce Diversity within the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke is pleased to welcome you to the Open Stage monthly webinar series, which is a targeted outreach effort for our diverse neuroscience community to learn about NINDS programs and network with NIH and NINDS program staff. Each webinar will feature a different NINDS program, division, or cluster with the goal of increasing the representation of our diverse groups in our portfolio. And this month, we are excited to have with us NINDS staff from all over the Institute who will speak on their journeys to NINDS. And before I get started, uh, I just have a few housekeeping items. Go to the next slide. Just a few meeting reminders. All attendees are initially muted. Um, so please submit your questions using the chat function. And a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and will be transcribed and archived on the NINDS website. Detail, details about where to find the archived version will be posted on social media and on our listservs. Uh, please do stay connected with us and feel free to email us if you have any questions about the webinar series. So with that, I will pass it off to Dr. David Jett to get us started. All right. So, um, hello everyone, I'm Dr. Dave Jett and welcome to, well actually over 169 registrants for this and welcome for, uh, to those who um, are actually uh, online now. And um, we're gonna have a webinar with some of our HBCU graduates that work here at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke or NINDS. So, um, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna hear from these several HBU, uh, C, uh, HBCU alumni who work here, and they'll discuss sort of their journey to NIH, how they got there, um, what we do here, and then some opportunities at NIH for students and postdocs and, and faculty. So for this slide, yeah, this is uh, you know. A lot of people don't realize that NIH is, it's not just one building or one institute. It's a lot of different kinds of institutes, actually 27 institutes and centers. Um, each one has their sort of own um, uh, uh, topic that they work or topics that they work on, like the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute works on heart and lung and the National Cancer Institute on cancer, National Eye Institute on eye, minority health and health disparities and so forth. We're gonna focus on our institute, which is the NINDS. And as the name um, implies, we are focused on the nervous system. So I guess this is for my journey here. I guess um, I'd say I had an interest in science from a early age, you know, watching TV and things like that. I, I knew it was something that I was interested in. And um, I finished high school, um, did okay, played basketball there and things like that. But I, I did pretty good grades and everything. And um, I ended up at uh, my beloved Hampton University. Well, actually it was Hampton Institute because I'm kind of an old guy, yes. So it was Hampton Institute back then. Um, finished Hampton, um, had a great time there ended up in graduate school at the University of Maryland College Park for my master's degree. And I earned a master's in um, environmental toxicology. And um, after that, I went and got a job because I needed that job, worked for a couple years or so, and ended up at uh, the University of Maryland School of Medicine to work on my doctorate. And I, um, did well and got my doctorate in neurotoxicology and pharmacology. And then after that, I went and did a postdoctoral fellowship at um, Johns Hopkins University or the, the, the hospital part. Um, did that for a few years, um, had a great time and did really well. And they asked me to join the faculty. So I actually joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins and was a faculty there for about a decade. And then I found this great opportunity at the uh, NIH, at NINDS, um, and I jumped on that and I've been here ever since for the last 20 some years. So next slide. 
So in terms of what I do, um, so I am the director of the Office of Neuroexposome and Toxicology or OneTox. Uh, my job is to lead the office. It has three branches, one on environmental neuroscience um, and how this affects diseases within our mission at NINDS. Um, also within my office is the NIH Counteract Program or Countermeasures Against Chemical Threats uh, to National Security, which I direct, but um, I, I really just listen to my program director, Dr. Spriggs, and just do what she tells me because she's really the, the leader of that program. And you'll hear from Dr. Spriggs later today. Um, and then the uh, other branch of the office is focused on chemical safety and um, drug toxicity liabilities, more of a translational research kind of thing. Um, I'm also you know, a scientific team leader at the Division of uh, Translational Research and, and do some other stuff at, uh, at NINDS. I'm also hold a position at Yale School of Public Health. So next slide. So you'll hear about opportunities um, for undergraduates, graduate students, funding for labs outside of NI, uh, NIH, faculty members at their institutes. Uh, next slide. And I just wanted to end with one um, important funding opp uh, opportunity. And this is from the Office of Programs to Enhance Neuroscience Workforce Diversity that is um, my guest sponsoring this webinar and is led by Dr. Michelle Jones London and her truly remarkable staff. Um, this is an opportunity, it solicits R01 grant applications. It's intended to support new investigators and at-risk investigators uh, from diverse backgrounds. And it includes those uh, from groups underrepresented in health-related sciences. So I really, I urge you to, to look at this funding opportunity. And as always, um, there's help at the NIH for questions. So next slide. So we will start uh, with Dr. Sarana Jackson, MD. She is a physician scientist. Uh, she is in our intramural uh, program branch, and she is head of the Developmental Therapeutics and Pharmacology Department. So with that, Dr. Jackson. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. And so this was me. This was me about seven or eight years old with my bumblebee sweater and just this curious little girl with these uh, cornrows in her hair and just excited about life. And so I still say that I'm excited about life. I was super excited about science and curiosity. And I see that with my kids now, just asking my husband and I a whole bunch of questions about why is this and why is that? And so I took that love of curiosity and love of life and I discovered that I really liked science. So my parents um, enrolled me in various science camps growing up. I went to science camps in uh, as early as I can remember seventh grade and it was called Having Fun with DNA. And I actually was on NBC News uh, talking about having fun with DNA. And it just happened to be at the time of OJ Simpson trial. So I was talking about rape kits on TV and my parents were so happy, but at the same time appalled. And so I took that same love of science and I applied for a program where in my senior year of high school, I went to classes half day. And because I was born and raised in Gaithersburg, Maryland, which is about two cities away from the National Institutes of Health, I, um, this Howard Hughes program allowed me to go to the NIH the second half of my day of, of a senior year of high school. So I was introduced to what NIH had to offer to me as a 12th grader. And then because I loved it and I thought it was cool to work in a lab and all the scientists, even though they were all geeks, I was learning things. And so in um, my senior year of high school, I also applied for a scholarship called the Undergraduate Scholarship Program. Next. And the Undergraduate Scholarship Program is an awesome program because in the same amount of years that you get the scholarship, you can go to any college you want to go to. Um, but you are required to give back and come to the NIH 
and give back that same amount of time. So I accepted a scholarship from the National Institutes of Health called the Undergraduate Scholarship Program for two years. So two years, I um, worked during the summer. And so this is a picture of me, I think is in, oh yeah, 2001. And I was required in 2000 and in 2001 to at some point give back to the NIH. So at the age of about 17, I had my future career at the NIH already set in stone. So still a great program that is ongoing today. And I'll talk a little bit about it a little bit later. Next. So from there, I was super excited. I took the funds from this undergraduate scholarship program and I went to Hampton University. Dr. Jett, it was Hampton University at the time that I attended. And so at that time I achieved an, um, my bachelor of science in molecular biology. And so I knew I wanted to be a scientist. Uh, I've told you that this whole time, but I said somewhere along the line, I'm a people person. I can talk to people, people can talk to me. And so I said, I'm gonna apply to medical school. So next. I then attended Eastern Virginia Medical School, which is about a good 30, 45 minutes away from Hampton, Virginia. It's in Norfolk, Virginia. And it's a really community-based uh, medicine type medical school. I thought I wanted to do more of kind of um, hands-on approach of community work uh, as a physician. And I wanted to be a scientist. So I said, I really like science. I really like patient care. Um, what type of physician do I want to be? And I decided I wanted to be a pediatrician. And so I took that love of science and children and medicine and went to, next slide, Orlando, Orlando, Florida. And I did my pediatric residency. So that was a three-year residency program. And then I said, taking care of kids and all their ailments and all their specificities is not enough for me. Because I had uh, initially done cancer research at the NIH back in high school and back in undergrad for those two years, I said, I'm going to do cancer research in children. And so I did an additional three-year fellowship at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, and I loved it. But for some reason, I said that that's not good enough. I want to do pediatric neuro-oncology research, so children who have brain tumors. And I want to know the intricacies of that, and why do they have this, and how can we do better for them? And so I took that love and passion to Johns Hopkins and did a pediatric neuro-oncology fellowship. So that was another two years. Stop counting how many years I've gone now. So then next slide. Then that led me to the NIH, where I've been here since 2015. And I am currently a tenure track investigator. And as Dr. Jett uh, mentioned earlier, I have my own lab, I see patients, I do clinical studies. And specifically, I am the head of the Developmental Therapeutics and Pharmacology Lab. It's focused on hindering communication between the blood brain barrier and malignant glioma. So I always like to be able to show a picture of kind of what I do. So you can see these orange kind of ugly um, brain tumor cells in the center of this nice plump juicy brain, and you have these microscopic tumor cells throughout. So what we know about the blood-brain barrier is next. If you look at the center of the tumor, you can see this kind of permeable blood-brain barrier where we're able to get drugs to these orange tumor cells very nicely. Next, permeable BBB, blood-brain barrier. As you get further and further away from the tumor, next, uh, what we call peritumoral, the drugs don't get there. And so we have a hard problem of the surgeon, the radiation uh, oncologist and myself, the oncologist do a pretty good job of treating the central tumor and sometimes the peritumoral areas next. But we do a horrible job of getting to the distant sites next because why? It has a very intact or impermeable blood brain barrier. And so we're left giving the kitchen sink to these adults and children with these ugly malignant glioma tumors, um, and that the therapies really affect more the central and the peritumoral areas, but it's really six to 12 months after we start therapy that the distance sites will start to show that it looks like we gave no therapy at all. So we have a lot of challenges in being able to treat these type of tumors. And so um, my lab specifically looks at how can we improve drug concentrations in those peritumoral and distant sites so that we can prolong survival and decrease toxicity to the rest of the body. Next slide. 
So I talked to you about my science, but I also have to talk to you about my activism. So how I got here today was a long, torturous road and a long road. And I had some angels and I had um, some not so great support along the way. And I had some good support along the way. I had a lot of people who did not look like me and who I did not feel uh, were inclusive of what I had to say and where I wanted to make my place in this world. Um, and I had that at various stages along the way. When I came to NIH, I also didn't see uh, any other people who looked like me and who were uh, also physician scientists and I still needed to press on. So this is just a showcase of one of the activism kind of at the NIH that I've been a part of. It's the Unite Initiative. And I'm a co-chair uh, of the T Committee and the T Committee is focused on transparency, accountability and sustainability uh, across uh, DEIA efforts, more DEI. And so this is one of the campaigns that I helped to spearhead. It's called the Recognition Project where we wanted uh, to do better with showcasing who is on these walls? So as a majority, we tend to see um, all white male individuals on walls as we walk down hallways in clinics and hospitals and office buildings. And what if we could walk down hallways and see people who look like us? Because you can't be what you don't see and what you don't have exposure to. So I'm, I'm proud to be a, proud, uh, a part of this campaign that has re really helped to diversify the artwork and diversify who's on these walls um, so that more younger people who want to continue on in the STEM space feel seen and feel included. So I happened to write an article about that, the power of inclusion overturning the white wall standard in stat news. Next slide. So I went through a whirlwind of how I got here. Undergraduate scholarship program is only one of several programs that are offered on campus for undergraduate students. Um, we also have summer internship programs, post-bac, post-doc training fellowships, and they can all be found on the OITE or Office of Intramural Training and Education website. So please, please, please just go into detail on that OIT website. Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, so, okay, our next speaker is Dr. Char uh, Chardell Spriggs. Uh, she is a program director in the uh, Division of Translational Research. And as I mentioned before, the real director of the NIH Counteract Program. So, Dr. Spriggs, it's all yours. Thanks, Dave. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm a first-generation college student that attended the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. The UMES was a, a beautiful campus with a small and nurturing environment. We had a really uh, close student-to-teacher contact ratio that uh, allowed for strong mentorship. I had a very strong mentor there in Dr. Kelly Mack. There were also many other opportunities there, uh, such as doing paid summer research internships and as early as my a freshman year, and then later participating in the Minority Access to Research Careers Program and professional organizations such as Novache, which gave us money to travel to scientific meetings and present our scientific findings. So after undergraduate studies, I went to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where I continued with this theme of strong uh, mentorship in the lab of Dr. Mike Summers, I was a Meyer Hall graduate research fellow. Um, the program was quite small then. I think there were seven students in our incoming class. Um, and then I successfully competed for a Mark pre-doctoral fellowship there as well. And that became kind of the blueprint for the Meyer Hall program. Also while in graduate school, I got married and I had my two children and they're seen here in this inset. So this was my crew on a graduation day. I then became a stay-at-home mom for three years, became heavily involved in the school community and the local community with uh, tons of volunteer activities. Uh, this was more than a full-time job, so it definitely belongs right here on my map. I found uh, re-entering the workforce to be uh, quite difficult. Uh, eventually, um, I was able to work at Howard Community College, 
Uh, many people saw my graduate work as not work but school. So I had to compete with what I was seeing as having kind of zero years experience or skills. Um, this connection was made from a fellow mom in my neighborhood who was a faculty at the community college and also had students that, uh, I guess, kids that went to my kids' schools. Now, after teaching for a bit, I realized that that might not be the right place for me, and I needed to go do a postdoc to increase my career opportunities later on. And I found entering the research workforce even harder than just going uh, to work and was able to find a home at the University of Maryland School of Medicine where I did my postdoctoral stories studies in the lab of Dave Weber, who was on my uh, research thesis at UMBC. And after that, I was hired at NINDS as a health program specialist. And so I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit what my current role is here at NINDS. So I'm a program director in the Division of Translational Research. Uh, my bread and butter is the Counteract program. So my main role is to manage the NIH Countermeasures Against Chemical Threats program. This is a trans NIH program that has been tasked by Congress with developing uh, better therapeutics to improve survivorship and outcomes against a specified list of chemical threats that can be most easily or most likely deployed against the civilian population. Uh, as a trans NIH program, we work collaboratively with institutes across NIH to manage a diverse portfolio that targets multiple organ systems but NINDS directly manages those projects that propose research on chemical threats that have primary and secondary effects on the nervous system. This includes nerve agents, cyanides, uh, some metabolic poisons, as well as anticoagulants. Uh, within DTR, I also manage a portfolio of grants in the IGNITE program. So some of the essential duties for my position include providing substantial input into the planning, development, implementation, an evaluation of research, organizing and conducting workshops or symposia uh, to foster collaboration and facilitate communication among investigators, advising the status of progress and emerging directions in a specified research field, and serving on interagency committees to establish and maintain effective collaborations across all the working parts of the Department of Health uh, and Human Services. So I am also invested in increasing diversity and achieving health equity and participate in several ongoing initiatives at NINDS, including being a founding member and co-chair of the Health Equity Workgroup, where we strive to increase awareness and discussion of topics that will decrease health inequities in and through NIH-funded research. We received a number of awards, a group and individual that I'm proud of in the inset you can see the Brains R Us team receiving an NIH Director's Award from uh, Dr. Francis Collins for an initiative on neuroscience outreach and education that was uh, led by Dr. Michelle Jones London in the open office. So I'm currently housed in the Division of Translational Research or DTR, and we offer a variety of programs that support the design, implementation, and management of research activities critical to translational challenges in the treatment of neurological disease. So we're helping researchers bridge that gap from the basic R01 research space uh, through the first in human clinical trials. Uh, we provide approximately $100 million a year annually for this in funding and resources through grants, cooperative agreements, and contracts to academic and industry researchers. We do this mainly through tailored uh, initiatives that many times feed into one another and they utilize milestones to de-risk the science and to stepwise help investigator achieve uh, meaningful translational research goals. An example here would be the IGNITE program, which is one of our earliest uh, programs in the translational uh, research space. 
entry criteria are you know, strong scientific premise, a robust, rigorous uh, data design, and a rationale that the proposed therapeutic would be a significant improvement over current therapies. The end goals of this program are closely aligned with the blueprint neurotherapeutics entry criteria. And in that way, we help people uh, reach their end goals. I wanna ask you to please visit the DTR website. Uh, there's a QR code here, as well as a spelled out link. A webinar such as this one are available on our website for all the programs and funding opportunities and initiatives that we offer. It's very important that you reach out to us. We can provide a programmatic advice, get you to the program where you need to be. And then once you're there, we can provide scientific and, uh, advice that could help improve uh, your applications. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, please consider us part of your network and uh, leverage our expertise. All right, thank you. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Ricky Benson, MD, PhD. He's one of our uh, double threats people with both an MD and a PhD. He is, um, he's, he's well known in, in both the medical and research community, well known. He's the director of the Office of Global Health and Health Disparities. And Richard's my old friend. So with that, Dr. Benson. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David, or for that very warm uh, introduction. Um, also would like to thank um, the members of the open office for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk today about my road to getting here to the uh, NIH. So um, I've always wanted to be uh, a doctor since I was uh, a young kid. My father growing up was a minister. My mother was a social worker. So helping people was sort of inside of me at that time. In high school, I went to uh, a magnet high school uh, in Akron, Ohio home of LeBron James. And uh, actually I started taking college classes in my 11th grade year. And so by the time I finished high school, I'd had several college classes under my belt from the University of Akron. Um, and so, but I wanted to go away to college. So I, I looked at various institutions and I came upon Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, in the upper left-hand uh, side of the screen, you can see uh, the, one of the logos for Fisk. We have two there. But you see the people there sitting, um, that's the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Um, the Fisk Jubilee Singers was a group of uh, students at Fisk who actually traveled around the world and raised money uh, to purchase the land where Fisk currently is, as well as Meharry and another um, high school in, um, in Nashville. So they uh, made a lot of money at that time. So I was into music and actually I went to Fisk and I was able to sing with the Jubilee Singers. Um, they're actually Grammy Award winning, recently won, won a Grammy. So I toured in college uh, around the country singing. So I, I love my experience at Fisk. I was a chemistry major uh, and actually had the opportunity to participate in um, one of the NIH programs. I have the NIH in the center because the NIH is sort of the center of all of my training and just like, um, uh, Shardell and, and others have mentioned as well, there uh, are other programs uh, that are out there to help you at various stages of your career. So I was actually a MARC um, uh, participant as well when I was in undergraduate school. Um, I participated in the program. I did research at the University of Cincinnati one summer, interestingly, in a department of neurology. Uh, and then I did research uh, at Fisk University campus. And then uh, one summer I did research at the NIH. And so that was my first experience working on the NIH campus when I was in undergraduate school. After undergraduate school, I knew I wanted to go to medical school. Uh, I didn't, uh, after finishing undergraduate school, I didn't uh, study uh, for the MCAT the way I, I um, needed to. So I took a gap year, the Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio then took the MCAT at that time and uh, was applying to medical schools. I got uh, interviews at several schools. When I interviewed at Meharry, um, they told me that they had an MD-PhD program there uh, and they wanted me to participate in that. Um, 
and they would pay my tuition and get a stipend and some other stuff. And so I couldn't turn that down. So I went to Meharry Medical College. You can see the logo uh, in the uh, upper right of the screen there. And uh, again, I participated in a pre-doctoral fellowship program, uh, which uh, was able to pay my tuition and, and everything through medical school. Um, I did research in basic science. It was in neuroscience at that time. Uh, I was doing uh, entomology related to Parkinson's disease. Uh, after uh, I finished my PhD, I finished medical school. I was, uh, took a class in undergraduate in uh, medical school called Excitable Cells. Uh, and it was talking about cells that can generate their own action potentials. And we talked about the cardiac myocytes as well as um, the uh, axons in the brain and how they can generate uh, action potentials through opening and closing of, of ionic channels. So it was really exciting. And so I said, wow, I can either go into cardiology or neurology. So I asked uh, someone that was a mentor to me at that time what field I should go into and uh, just made sense. Well, you have a PhD in neuroscience and there are very few uh, neurologists of color uh, at that time. So I made the decision to go into the field of neurology. I did my neurology um, residency at the Harvard Longwood program in, uh, in Boston. Uh, so I have a picture in the lower um, left-hand corner there uh, at that time. So at, at Harvard, I, I realized when I was doing my rotations that there were so many um, uh, African-Americans coming in with strokes. Uh, and I noticed the big disparity in strokes. And so that got me interested in, in stroke at that time. So after completing my neurology residency at Harvard, I um, went to Columbia in New York and I did a stroke fellowship. Um, I worked with uh, Dr. Ralph Sacco, who was um, the investigator of the first study looking at strokes in Blacks, Whites, and Hispanics living in the same community. And so also uh, as a fellow, I was able to get a master's in epidemiology at the Columbia uh, Melman School of Public Health. And that was also through an NIH uh, program as well uh, that funded um, my, uh, my master's program at that time. So again, the, the NIH was central to a lot of things that I, that I did in terms of my training. So after I finished that training in, in um, New York, I worked, I was on faculty at uh, Long Island Long Island Jewish Medical Center and some other medical centers in New York. Um, and I, at that time, was not using my uh, PhD as much. And so I wanted to do something different. I considered either going into industry, um, I applied for a job at Merck and received that, or either coming to the NIH. So I um, interviewed at uh, that time, it was called the Office of Minority Health and Research. I came to the NINDS uh, like in 2005. I worked there uh, with actually David and Michelle. We were in the same office at that time, David Chet and uh, Michelle Jones London, and um, did that until uh, 2008. I left the NIH. I loved the job at that time, but I wanted to do more clinical work. I left uh, and I worked at Georgetown. I was the associate professor at Georgetown and um, the associate director of the stroke program at one of the hospitals in the Washington, D.C. area. And we actually worked. Uh, for the NIH uh, intramural stroke program. So I was still doing uh, research with the um, NIH at that time. So I did that for a number of years until uh, my current position, next slide, uh, my current position um, in the, uh, was to come back to the, uh, the office. Uh, there was no office at the NINDS dealing with uh, health disparities at that time. There was a global health office, but the Institute wanted to uh, build up its programs related to health equity and health disparities, as well as uh, to try to enhance the global health program. So I came back in uh, 2019 to the um, NINDS to, um, to start up the Office of Global Health and Health Disparities. And we sort of, we lead the uh, Institute's efforts related to global health, uh, as well as um, uh, issues related to health disparities. And so I have some of the things listed there on the slide related to that. So I think I'm going to stop there. I'm probably at time. Next slide. So uh, if anyone has any questions, we actually have a website that's very active. You can uh, uh, scan this QR code or take a picture of it and, and pull it up later. Uh, that will take you to our website and it talks about all the different things that we do. We also have a listserv where we uh, every week we send out 
um, funding announcements and other information related to global health and health disparities. And I look forward to um, answering questions a little later on. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Okay, so let's move on to our next uh, speaker. And that is Dr. Marguerite Matthews. She's the program director in the Office of Programs to Enhance Neuroscience Workforce, Workforce Diversity. And so with that, Dr. Matthews. Thank you, Dr. Jett. It is so wonderful to be with you all today. Thank you um, for being here. And many thanks to my colleagues um, for hearing their stories. You all are fascinating people. Um, I know and have worked with many of you um, over the years, but I have loved hearing your stories. So thank you for sharing. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my journey here. It looks linear um, just because of time, but it wasn't because I planned to be here um, at the NIH. Um, I started off as a high school student thinking I would go on to be a writer um, and not like a science writer, but um, a writer of novels, poetry, and short stories. Uh, I loved English. It was my favorite subject in school, but I was really good at a bunch of different subjects. And so my junior year in my chemistry class, um, which I loved, I loved learning about chemistry. Never wanted to be a chemist necessarily, but I really got into learning about molecules and how they were shaped, how they were named, how they worked together. And my chemistry teacher pulled me aside one day and said, I think you should apply for the summer internship. And they had sites at the Salk Institute in La Jolla, Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla and UCSD, which is also in La Jolla, um, San Diego, California. And I thought that sounds like the most boring thing ever. Why would I wanna do that working in a lab? Like, oh, do I look like Dexter's laboratory to you? I don't think so. So I applied anyway, because I trusted him as a teacher. I thought he was, um, just a really great supporter of me. And even though I didn't love science, like that wasn't where I was working towards, he still sort of pushed me in that general direction anyway. So I got into this program. I did two summers at the Salk Institute um, and I prepared for a science fair project my senior year with the same chemistry teacher who taught an advanced biology and chemistry course. And I won the San Diego Science Fair I won the California, I, I um, won first place in my division at the state science fair. And sort of for the first time, I saw myself as someone who could be a scientist, that scientists could look like me. Most of the people in the lab that I worked at at the Salt Institute were white or Asian. Nobody in there was Hispanic. Nobody in there um, was identified as black. And even though I was sort of the odd person out in the lab, just based on my background, I never felt alone. Like I never felt like I was just one person. It was kind of awkward because I was a high school student and everyone else in the lab was like a graduate student or above, but I felt really supported. I had a great mentor who helped me. Everyone in the lab sort of rallied around me if I needed anything. Sometimes it just stopped by my uh, workbench and asked me questions. But by the second summer that I was there, I was telling people how to stain um, tissue, how to mount slides, how to use the confocal microscope. Like I became an expert at a very young age. And you would think maybe that would spur me to want to be a scientist. Well, you would be wrong. <laughs> um, I thought I would go to medical school because I wanted to help people. I wanted to do something that made an impact. Medical physicians are a very noble profession. My father was a medical doctor. And so I went to Spelman College, studied biochemistry, um, and prepared to go to medical school. I was part of the Health Careers Club the health careers program. I was the president of the chemistry club. Like I did all this stuff, continued to do research, did a summer at Duke, two summers at Merck, um, doing research internships. Still did not think I wanted to be a researcher, but said, okay, well, I can help people and still do research. So maybe I'll go get an MD, PhD. And then I'm on these medical school interviews. And I thought, girl, you don't even like blood. Like you don't even like sick people. <laughs> why, would you, why would you want to be a physician? And I just didn't enjoy any of the interviews I was on. Like I just never connected with the students, with the professors, and I felt a little lost. I'm here in my senior year. I've already missed the deadlines for other, um, for most PhD programs. I hadn't taken the GRE because I hadn't planned to go get just one, just a PhD. I was going to do the combined program, so I had taken the MCAT. 
And then one day I got a call from a professor at Carnegie Mellon University who recruited me. I ended up applying, getting accepted into their program. And after some drama, um, uh, transferred to the University of Pittsburgh. But I had never intended to get just a PhD in the sciences. But I had a lot of support that said, you have all this research experience. Why not use it in this way? And so I went down that path simply because there were people there who supported me and saw something in me that I didn't necessarily see in myself. Like I kind of had a plan, but I was still somewhat aimless and almost too hyper-focused not really considering all of the broad possibilities that there could be. Um, so I went to the University of Pittsburgh. I studied uh, neuroscience, um, adolescent brain development using um, a rat animal model. And I went to do a postdoc in um, Oregon. I was also recruited. I'm at a conference one day talking to this very tall black man who I thought was um, a basketball player uh, because he's like six five. Um, actually, he was a basketball player. He went to college on a basketball scholarship. Um, he's like, hey, you should come to Portland and work with me. And so I'm there doing this postdoc, not really intending to do a postdoc, but not sure what else to do. Like, what do you do with a PhD, but you don't want to be a faculty member? And I had the opportunity to work with him. I started um, a youth engaged in science outreach program to get more youth of color interested in the sciences. And I also started a postdoc program to recruit more postdocs of color to um, Oregon Health and Science University. I'm sorry, sorry for using the acronym. And it really showed me that I care more about the people doing research and that people can see that they can be a scientist than I was about being a scientist myself. And that's how I ended up at the NIH. Um, I had an opportunity to do a fellowship um, in science policy, and I have since moved on to do programs um, with the office, but almost all of my time here at NIH has been focused on the people doing science, and especially those who are in school still, um, working towards getting their degrees, as well as folks who are starting their independent research um, careers. Next slide. And now I have the pleasure to run or to help manage all of these diversity programs. Now, you may be saying to yourself, girl, I can't read any of this. This is too small. But that just goes to show you how many different programs our institute and INDS supports um, for training and career development. So there are a number of programs that we have and the ones um, shaded in purple um, or towards the bottom of the screen um, that are sort of outlined with the pin. Those are programs that my office, Michelle Jones London, um, who leads the office, those are all the things that we sort of manage. And most of them are for folks from underrepresented backgrounds, racial and ethnic, um, folks with disabilities and folks from disadvantaged backgrounds. And we have it all the way, we have programs all the way to support high school students through folks just getting um, new faculty. So I'm happy to answer any questions about getting grants um, as a student thinking about going to graduate school, um, as a faculty member who wants to, um, to be able to support a student um, in your research laboratory or ways that you can get into continuing to be invested in science, but not necessarily having um, a research faculty job. Next slide, please. And one last shameless plug, as part of my job, I don't just manage a grant portfolio, but I get to highlight wonderful, amazing people in the field. And so my colleague, Dr. Lauren Ulrich and I are co-hosts of a podcast called Building Up the Nerve. Um, and season three is focused all on mentoring, but season one and season two have a lot of great information about grants. So I encourage you to check it out. The link is in the chat. Um, and I'm also happy to talk a little bit more about how you can still be creative and tell stories um, in a scientific job. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Okay. Let's keep it going. And <clears throat> our next speaker, <clears throat> excuse me, is Dr. Latasia uh, Jones. She's MS PhD. Uh, she is working as a scientific review officer in the scientific re review branch. And she's a pretty remarkable person. And I'll, I'll let her uh, go on with her talk, Dr. Jones. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. And thank you for being here once again. And thank you for this amazing opportunity to talk on behalf of, I guess, scientific review officers, NIH, NINDS, and whomever else I may represent while speaking. 
Um, so my amazing journey way before college started actually by a mishap. So I thought I was going to be a basketball player and I thought I was going to achieve so much in sports. My family has more so of a template of sports achievements and or uh, military achievements. So I was never even interested in going into college or looking towards more of the academic journey. Um, and it was this unfortunate day as a middle schooler while I was playing basketball and um, in my science class, I was goofing off too much. And my mom kept warning me along the way, if you continue to talk too much in your course and your teacher sends back these you know, remarks saying that you're not doing well in your course, then I will have to take you off the basketball team. And lo and behold, as you probably already know the story, I was removed from the basketball team as a source of punishment, but it also redirected me to focus on my course. And I all of a sudden fell in love with science. I realized that some of the things that was being taught was in everyday life. And from there, I joined a debate team. And the only question I remember having in this debate team, the, I was able to get the answer and the answer was chlorophyll. And I knew from there that obviously there was some type of alignment in the journey that I needed to travel in. So even with all of that being said, when I started at the amazing Virginia State University, which is the alma mater that I'm always going to love, um, I started on pre-med track going the biology route, and I just knew I was going to become an MD. And during my freshman year, I saw a flyer on the wall, and it was asking for individuals who would like to uh, participate in a research internship opportunity at the College of William & Mary. And it was asking for upperclassmen, as I told you, I was a freshman at the time. And the person that was in charge of it was Dr. Glenn Harris, who later became my advisor. And I just kept asking him repeatedly every week, is there somebody that already applied? Is there any way you can push me through? And fortunate for me, no one else applied. I was able to be bumped up to you know, a priority as far as an applicant. And they took me on as early as it was to explore and to experience the lab environment and the lab um, excitement that I had already, that I never knew I would ever receive within that type of environment. At this point, I also figured out a lot of other things. Not only was this excitement for the laboratory heightened, but I also met the first female that I've ever met that owned her own lab. So, and she literally did the firing, the hiring, the restructuring of experiments, the publishing, and she was called on as a um, world-renowned scientist in what she was focusing on. So this was an amazing experience for me that not only redirected my path, but it motivated me to continue in this path. Um, I then went to con continue research, which eventually led me into my master's research under the guidance of Dr. Glenn Harris and also with Dr. Brian Sayre. And in that research, I found out some other things about myself. I took a trip to Ghana where I I did some outreach, taught students English, science, and math, and fell in love with the fact that I can put my excitement for STEM along with how I teach kids and hopefully create new programming ideas that would fill in the gaps along the way as far as keeping them excited for STEM as well. So I decided from there that I wanted to continue doing this. And the best way that I thought to, of doing that was to receive a PhD or to earn a PhD. So I applied for certain departments in colleges. And as you can see, I went to, into the Department of Bio, uh, Biomedical Sciences at Florida State University, where I was the first African-American to earn a PhD. And I also just continued to explore the outreach activities that I was able to spearhead and create, as well as you know, still participating in organizations that allowed me to strengthen my ability to do these programs and these um, activities. I then went from there to my postdoc at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C. And there I was working under, also working under a uh, diversity supplement. And my focus was from PhD all the way to my postdoc was now autism research, but neuroscience based utilizing the molecular techniques that I had gained from being at Virginia State University. And I knew that this was my passion because along the way I was a lot, I was able to meet some of the people that I was helping because of the collaborations that we had with hospitals in receiving samples. I was allowed to meet the families and some of the um, individuals who were putting endowments into this research. 
And I realized not only how my passion was thriving off of this, but also just the ability to help in individuals within a lab setting. A lot of times when we think about a lab, we're thinking about the experimental model and maybe how you know genius a, a person may be, but we don't often get that, um, that personal touch when it comes to being in person with the individuals that we're helping. And so it was a remarkable, remarkable experience to have when I met these individuals that I was helping and continued to motivate me. But I knew that being within a laboratory environment was not the end goal for me. As you can see, I love to speak and I love to do outreach activities. Um, I wanted to kind of find a more suitable position that would utilize my passion for neuroscience and helping others, but also allow me to educate, allow me to do more outreach and not have to be within a lab setting all day, every day. So in the midst of looking for what that position sounds like, because it, it sounds like an impossible position sometimes, right? Like there's no way that position exists. I decided to um, apply for fellowships and I landed at the American Society for Microbiology in an ethics fellowship where I was literally looking in publications that were in the process of being uh, published, it, with published manuscripts that were trying to be published at the American Society for Microbiology and looking for data fabrication, plagiarism, or any other types of scientific misconduct. In this position, I learned a lot of things about communicating with early career um, scientists, as well as the more mature ones and more senior ones within the labs and trying to educate them about the proper ways and the proper processes in, in publishing their manuscripts. Uh, I also realized that a lot of the skills that you learn with or pick up within your laboratory setting are translatable as far as transitioning to other positions that may not be within a lab setting. So now at this point, I knew the sky wasn't even the limit. And after being promoted to the senior ethics specialist, at this uh, amazing, amazing, amazing organization, I decided I kind of sort of wanted to still go back to my home and my passion, which is neuroscience. So I found my way back to that by coming here at NIH, where I'm working in NINDS as a scientific review officer. Next slide, please. So just in case anyone is unfamiliar with what a scientific review officer does, um, it's a lot of things. <laughs> so I wish I could just sum it up in one, two or three words, but I can't. But I think it's a, we play a really, really, really important part and there's other players involved. You, you constantly communicate with others, whether it's the applicants, the reviewers, the programs office and so on to achieve a lot of different goals. Um, a lot of things that we do is managing and leading NIH. I, I manage and lead NIH closed scientific grant review meetings. I recruit um, reviewers with the expertise needed and also those who have, are qualified to review certain grants. Um, I'm looking at for anything and everything such as the actual expertise, uh, the training record of an individual, publication record, or have they earned grants on their own as well? Um, especially with some of the grants that I have under my control, I'm looking for individuals who can assist with guiding future scientists and applying for their own grants, publications, uh, improving their publications and completely structuring the career trajectory that will put them in a successful review policies to novice reviewers, participate and contribute to NINDS wide workshops and grant funding meetings, coordinate orientations and meetings, which are really important for those newer reviewers to become more acclimated with the newer FOAs or even ones that I'm asking to recruit them to uh, review. We want to make sure that they all understand the reviewer guidelines for these applications so that they know how to evaluate them properly and to properly provide good feedback. Um, and last but definitely not least, I pre prepare summary statements, record scores, and establish expectations. But most importantly, and as I mentioned already, I like to track the progress through peer review process and provide feedback, but also communicating with all the other offices and NIH staff who are responsible for this process and definitely providing feedback to the applicants as well as assisting them by answering the questions along the way. Next slide, please. And of course, I have a life or somewhat of a life outside of here where I also do other things such as outreach, advocate, educate, and mentor. So one of, a few things that I would like to mention is in this picture depicted here, I am a AAAS If Then Ambassador which is an initiative to bring and highlight uh, women within STEM careers and academic programs. And we have what's called a traveling statue exhibit, which each one of us has our own statue. 
that travels from a different location to another location. And the purpose of it being a traveling statue exhibit is to make sure that is, this is an accessible resource specifically for young girls, but for anyone and everyone to be inspired by women in STEM to one, understand that this is a norm and that we should be all accepting of the diversity in STEM, but also to highlight that a lot of times we do not look at that diversity and here it is, it, it exists, right? So we are trying to show that these individuals exist in these fields and we're trying to progress and push it through. Many of us are also advocates and educators and mentors as well. I also have speak to a lot of different schools, I, um, especially HBCUs, of course. And I have my own initiatives such as Stemming While Black, which is a program to enhance and promote those who are Black or, and or African American within STEM programs and to showcase them as mentors to others, as well as Hey Dr. Tay, which is my brand to completely and utterly show the STEM excitement that I have and hopefully share that to the newer generations through small engaging experiments that they can do from home. But I also travel and use these for like the engaging parts of my, my conversations and talks that I have at schools from university level all the way to preschool. And you would be amazed at how excited they are across the board. Next slide, please. So last but not least, I do not wanna leave without letting you know some of the opportunities that are here for you all, especially to those early career reviewers are those early career scientists who are interested in reviewing in the future. So CSR definitely has a program called the Early Career Reviewer Program, which is aims to help early career scientists to become more competitive as grant applicants through firsthand experience with the peer review process. This also will allow us to enrich the diversity within the pool of trained reviewers. So please utilize the website. I think somebody just posted it in chat as well. Um, if you would like to learn more information about that, this is the website that not only shows you how to apply, but it will show you the qualifications. And then the big thing here is the benefits of it, working side by side with some of the most accomplished researchers in your field, learning how to identify, learning how reviewers determine overall impact scores, improve your own grant writing skills, serve the scientific community, and in developing research evaluation and critique writing skills. And last but not least, I am always looking for um, new reviewers as well. And as you all know, and I've said this earlier, I think that the grant review process is the most pivotal part in any young scientist's life as it subjects the research and career goals of the applicant to constructive criticism. So if you are interested in providing critical feedback to an aspiring neuroscientist, please email me at lutasia.jones at nih.gov. And I am welcoming any questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I cannot, I, I just wanted to say, I cannot stress how important that program is for um, early review, but it, it really makes a difference. So um, our last and certainly not, uh-oh, what's this, unmute myself? You guys can hear me, right? Yes, I hear you. So, yeah, last but not least is uh, Dr. James Washington. Um, he is a supervisory grants management officer in the grants management branch. He is an old friend and it's, he's the person you wanna go talk to when you have something on your mind. <laughs> so with that, I will uh, turn this over to um, Dr. Washington. Thank you, Dr. Chad. Uh, good evening, everybody. And aren't you excited about what we've experienced so far this afternoon? All for you. And we hope that uh, this is this will be invaluable to you. Um, again, I'm James Washington. And in gather, gathering information for this, for this presentation this afternoon, I pondered a little bit about how to roll this thing out. And if you notice on this slide, the very first picture you see is a picture of Dr. King uh, leading a march in my hometown of Grenada, Mississippi. And this picture was taken in 1966, uh, some 12 years after uh, the Topeka decision by the Supreme Court, which stated that all schools in this country should uh, integrate with all deliberate speed. But here in my hometown, it was 12 years later. And not only do you see Dr. King in this picture, but you see he has his hands on 
two, 12, two second grade students. And I know that they're second grade students because they are and were my classmates. And now behind Dr. King, you see a man holding, uh, lifting a young girl in his hand, another second grade student. Uh, that man is uh, the United States ambassador to the United Nations, uh, Andrew Young, who was the second black mayor of Atlanta. In between Andrew Young and if you look a little closer, there's another man standing behind Dr. King. That's the face of Joan Baez, singer and songwriter from the 60s and 70s. And the, the gentleman next to her is Reverend um, Hosea Williams. And so oftentimes when you drive through Atlanta, you see Hosea Williams Boulevard or his exit. This is at Hosea Williams. And I bring this picture up because this sets the foundation as to how I arrived in a, in a sense at the NIH. Um, again, this is 1966, I'm second grade. The schools weren't uh, integrated yet. So it took uh, superpowers such as Dr. King and, and Reverend Abernathy and Joan Baez and Andy Young to come to my hometown uh, uh, autumn day in September of that year uh, to help integrate the schools. And so this took place and right at the height of the civil rights movement uh, in, in our country. And um, so from there, uh, this is 66, I'm second grade, but I actually had my first experience in an integrated uh, environment when I was fifth grade. So from first grade to fifth grade or fourth grade, I'm at all black schools. And uh, I remember receiving uh, hand-me-down books from the white elementary schools. Um, their stickers were stamped in there. We would get the fifth edition when the 10th edition of that book was already out. And I'm going somewhere with this. Stay with me if you can. And so we were receiving back then hand-me-down books and supplies um, that were outdated. But nevertheless, uh, we persevered. And I bring this up also because my journey to the NIH is nothing short of a miracle. It's somewhat unorthodox. It may be a little unusual. Um, I didn't have the luxury of having parents who had degrees or who were educated. In fact, my parents were farmers, former sharecroppers with very little education. And I am the eighth child of 11. Uh, I have five brothers who are older. And at the time I had uh, three sisters who uh, were older. But the thing about my parents is that they made sure that we all got education and that we all went to college. It was an option, you had to do this. And so they instilled on in us at, at, at an early age, um, the education piece. And so um, in high school, I was an outstanding athlete. I was one of the, literally one of the fastest sprinters uh, in my state, not just my little small rural town, but in the state. Um, and I was approached by several different PWIs to come to their school and to play football and to run track. And up until the spring of my senior year of high school, that's the direction I was headed. I was on my way to a PWI within the state of Mississippi and I was excited about it. Now, remember I said I had gone through uh, the integration process. Um, my hometown at that time was predominantly white. And so most of the recognition and the accolades and the awards, the white students always got those. So in my senior year, uh, high school, I got to thinking about a whole lot of things. You know, at 17, your mind is all over the place. And so at the very last minute, I decided and I selected my HBCU, Jackson State University. To the too much uh, disappointment of some of my coaches in high school, uh, but to, um, to my pleasure, it has been a pleasure for me. Uh, at Jackson State, I met and married the love of my life, uh, Esther Hope Washington, who was uh, in 1984 Olympian, track star, um, representing her native country of Trinidad and Tobago. And Esther and I have three beautiful, wonderful daughters uh, who happens, all three who happens to be undergrad HBCU graduates. Our oldest daughter, Francesca, uh, she's a graduate of Alcorn State University. She's also a supervisor in one of the labs here at the National Institutes of Health. Our middle daughter, Dr. Jet, as you well know, Ashley is a member of your 
and Dr. Jackson, she's a member uh, of your alma mater, uh, Hampton University. And, uh, and it, the way things work out, Ashley is employed at Spelman, <laughs> another HBCU. And finally, our third daughter, Amanda. Amanda is also a graduate, uh, Dr. Matthews, of, of your Spelman College. So she's your Spelman sister. And she's employed with uh, DC Public Schools as a recruiter for Bard High School College. All of this is, is part of how I got to the, to the NIH. And so prior to coming to the, well, right, after, right after, after graduating from Jackson State, no, before I graduated from Jackson State, I did a semester internship at the VA Medical Center in Tuskegee, Alabama. And I chose to do my internship at Tuskegee, Alabama because of the, the culture and the heritage of Tuskegee uh, and Tuskegee uh, VA Medical Center because it was the first black all operated uh, uh, veterans hospital for blacks established, I think in 1923. But anyway, I matriculated through that um, shortly after completing that program, I went back to Jackson State and pursued a master's. And here's the funny thing. I mentioned my wife, well, and I mentioned the track part. Well, in 1983, uh, we were going out of state to grad school, Esther and I were. But Esther decided to stay in Jackson and to train under her coach who had been coaching her for uh, four or five years. And so me being bitten by the love bug, you know, at 22, 23 years old, I decided to stay in Jackson and go to, to grad school along with her. So we both graduated from Jackson State uh, together. Uh, and in fact, we graduated as husband and wife because the second year of grad school, we did, uh, we got married. And so after living in Jackson for a while, we decided to move to Louisiana. And so we migrated to Louisiana, whereby I took a job. Uh, now, let me back up a little bit. My undergrad degree had nothing to do with biology, chemistry, anything like that, although I took some courses because of my major. My major is something that's really kind of strange to some of you. It's called therapeutic recreation, whereby clinicians take the activity or the modalities of recreation and put them in a therapeutic form and you work primarily in a clinical sense in a setting as I did. Now there are some other areas that uh, were known as TRs. TRs work in different settings, but for me for 16 years, I worked in a clinical setting. And so I was a senior uh, uh, therapeutic recreation specialist and later on became a supervisor. And in all of my experiences as a therapeutic recreation specialist, becoming a senior specialist and then becoming head of a department, I was always surrounded by people who didn't look like me. Uh, in fact, when I was at the Terrell Rehabilitation Center in New Orleans, a huge rehabilitation center, and I was only one of two uh, black department heads. And so that was kind of eerie a little bit. And so, but I, 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 we, we muddled through that because I remember where I came from and coming from an HBCU uh, such as Jackson State, I, I knew that um, I would be in a minority setting or a minority in the setting, but it, it, it challenged me and it caused me to excel. So I never felt inferior. I never felt intimidated. I always felt that I had gained enough knowledge at Jackson State that I could do and live out the adage of running faster and jumping higher. And I always set myself apart to do that. Um, and so eventually, um, we had grown to the middle of Louisiana in a sense. And also in Louisiana, I answered the call to ministry. So I'm a bi, I'm, a, I'm what is called a bivocational pastor at this point in my life. Um, but prior to that, uh, and before seminary, I answered the call to ministry. So now I'm juggling uh, two acts. I have uh, my career on one hand and the call to ministry on the other hand. And how did these things in a face and um, it's just a lot of stuff was happening. And so um, as faith would have it, uh, Esther was here in Bethesda uh, assisting her sister who lived in Bethesda, in Bethesda at the time. And she came up to visit her sister. And remember I, I mentioned that we were contemplating leaving Louisiana. And so Esther was online looking at some stuff. Um, this, is, this is early names or mid, mid 90s, but anyway, she ran, up across, ran across the NIH and she told me, she said, James, there's, there's a position uh, at NIH. And so long story, I applied for the position, um, came up for an interview 
And during the interview, it just so happened that the colleagues in the NIH Clinical Center, which again, an environment of about 35, 40 people with only about four or five of us uh, African-Americans. And so, but the thing is, about a year before coming for the interview, I had written an article in one of our national periodicals and it had gained a lot of recognition. And so name recognition I had going into the interview and I was offered the position, accepted it, the position. And probably, I guess about a year and a half after being on board in the clinical center, I applied for the National Institutes of Health Management Intern Program. And I was selected for that program, which is a, a at that time, it was a year long program, now it's two years. It was a year long program whereby you were given the opportunity to rotate to various management or managerial positions throughout the NIH. Now this exclusive elite program, if you will, it was geared toward preparing um, future leaders, managerial leaders of the National Institutes of Health. And so I was accepted into that program. I was in a class of about 16, 17 people. And at that time, once again, I was the third person or the only, the only three people in my class were African-Americans. And uh, while I was rotating through, I did a rotation at NINDS. And I fell in love with NINDS because outside of NDI, uh, NINDS, this was the first opportunity at the NIH where I was engaged in so many sophisticated, educated, intelligent uh, Black people. I was just excited to be around I mean, in that environment. Because remember now, all of my career, I'm working with predominantly white people. Now, after becoming a specialist, I decided to stay at the NIH and to stay at NINDS. And down the road, I became um, a grants management officer, supervisory grants management officer. I'm not the chief grants management officer. Next slide. And so as we look at this next slide, you can see kind of what I do at NIH. I'm a supervisory grants management officer slash team leader. Um, there are nine employees on my team. And you heard about all the dynamic programs uh, that my colleagues have mentioned to you and the diversity programs. Well, it's my job as a grants management specialist first uh, and a grants management officer to adhere to uh, rules and regulations, federal rules and regulations, so that when you receive a grant from the NIH or from the NINDS, when you, once you get that award, my name or one of, one of my colleagues in grants management, our name will be at the bottom of that, of that, uh, that letter that you will receive saying that you have been awarded a grant from the National Institutes of Health. So I partner with the scientists to make sure that the rules and regulations uh, are adhered to so that we can properly administer the funds to you. And as I conclude on this presentation, my portion of it, I too am a part of the United, United a part of the NIH's Unite uh, initiative. Um, and you heard my colleague, uh, I believe it was Dr. Spriggs, Dr. Jackson, I'm sorry, Dr. Jackson, who mentioned um, that she was a part of this, this initiative as well. This initiative in general is set up so that we can really, the NIH can really walk out diversity, inclusion, uh, and, and um, accessibility um, so that we can reflect society. In other words, the NIH, in my opinion, as well as throughout the federal government, should reflect the people so that we can really be for the people, other people, and by the people. And so I am a part of that. And I'm also, as you can see at the bottom, uh, I am the founding pastor of Emmanuel City of Hope. And so for the last 13 years, I've been doing that. Uh, our youngest daughter used to refer to me as Superman because she couldn't figure out, Dad, how can you do all of that? Be a father, a husband, and you know all of this. But by grace, we do it. And so I would encourage you uh, who are listening to, to today that as you get educated on the various uh, educational opportunities and grant opportunities, that you partner with your sponsored research offices at your locations, because these individuals are gonna be the ones who are gonna help you write these grants. And they're gonna know about the funding opportunities that the NIH uh, is, 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 is putting out there. So that's kind of my thing in a nutshell. 
Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Washington. And uh, yeah, I, I won't say that I asked you to encourage your daughter to go to Hampton, but I'm just saying, you know. Um, so, you know, we're going to do some question and answers. But before that, I would like to ask for the boss to say a few words, Dr. Michelle Jones London, who's the director of this office. And I could go on about her, but, you know, she's, she's, my sister, so I would be biased. So I don't know if Michelle, can you, can you, are you still on? Can you jump on and say a few words? Yeah, my, so David Jett, for those who don't know, is my big brother and my NIH mentor. I just, I mean, the words that I would have to say is just, wow. Even though I have known most of you for a while, just to hear your stories all together, it is just, it's just really inspiring. And hopefully those, at the presentation today, you know, we always talk about us existing, right? There's a myth that there aren't any African Americans or Blacks in science at all. So I think today you proved a couple of things. You proved that we exist, we are here. We're not only surviving, but you are thriving. And to have this level of Black excellence right before the Juneteenth weekend and to know what that weekend means and to think about. Um, our enslaved ancestors, but then to see all of your journeys, it's, it's really inspiring and it just feels great, but it also chokes me up. Um, it's amazing. And so those in the audience, you know, I would just say, let this, let this be inspiration. Let this be a testimony to you um, that you define your career, you define your pathway, and there is a space for you and that you're not just an N of one. It may look like that from where you sit or, um, or when you're thinking about these different career paths or opportunities, but know that, um, especially this generation, you, you, do, you do have um, a space of people that are already there and willing to welcome and willing to share their experiences and journeys to make your journey a little bit easier. So thank you all for giving time for this. And thank you, David, for letting me say a few words even though I didn't go to an HBCU. <laughs> You're honorary. Um, so I'm gonna turn this over to, uh, it's gonna be Marguerite, right? Me. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So yes. Q and A. All right, since we are a little bit short on time, um, hopefully um, the questions that are asked to you all can give sort of succinct answers. I know for some of us that will be difficult, but um, Dr. Jett, I'm gonna start with you. Can you provide some quick advice on navigating the tenure track route? What are some things that a person interested in going on a tenure track, um, having a tenure track career should focus on? Sorry about that. I think the first thing that has to come to my mind is grants, grants, grants. And, you know, um, for most places, when you're on the tenure track, you're looking for, uh, grants that um, you know, strengthen your lab and strengthen their um, budget, <laughs> to be perfectly frank. So, um, and along with um, making sure that you can write good grants, one, you need a good mentor, someone that's um, more senior in the department that you're working in to help you um, think about writing good grants. Um, and then with that goes collaborators, good collaborators that you can bring on um, that are a bit more senior that will allow for um, almost more trust that you're going to get the work done. Um, you you got to know the scientific landscape. You got to know what's um, topical at that point and not write something that's sort of oh, been there, done that. Um, and then I say the last thing that I, I, I do a lot of mentoring to, to, to people that are on the tenure track, perseverance. You know, uh, when I first, my first grant, when I put it in and it came back to me, you know, I said, how dare they not understand, you know, this is, you know, I'm ready to take this to the president. You know, how can they not understand this? Is, and some, one of the senior faculty looked at me and said, what makes you think you're different from the rest of us? You have to just keep trying and not get discouraged. So I think so those are some of the things that I would think about um, 
when you know on the on the tenure track. So that's that's really great advice. And and I think one of the key messages I heard is you're not alone. There are plenty of people that are there to support you on the NIH side or the funding source side, but also within your own university. Um, Dr. Spriggs, can you briefly tell us about some funding opportunities and other resources that might be available to folks who have small businesses, um, especially with that um, have NIH uh, mission relevant um, uh, science behind it? Sure, sure. I actually want to direct anyone who's interested in the small business program to the open stage small business webinar. We're going to post that link in the chat. But also just know that if you do qualify for the SBIR program, it's a wonderful opportunity because NIH has actually set aside a percentage of its budget, R01 budget, to fund SBIR opportunities. So you're actually competing in a smaller pool of applicants and money for that pot and it's guaranteed funds that we have to spend. So please take a look at uh, what we wanna post in the chat and if you apply, please contact uh, Emily Caparello, who is the director of the SBIR program. Her information is on the DTR webpage. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Dr. Jackson, can you, can you talk to us about having it all? Can you have it all? Can you be a world-renowned scientist, physician, uh, the, the face of NIH, as well as being a mom and a wife? Or what, is, what does work-life balance look like for you? So the, the first answer is no, you cannot have it all. <laughs> it can look from the outside like you have it all, but shoot, on a typical day, I'm all over the place, mentally, physically, emotionally, not spiritually. I know, I know where, who, whose child I am. Um, so I don't like to think of it like a seesaw of balance. I like to think of it as harmony, whereas certain days I'm being an awesome mother, an awesome wife, an awesome scientist, an awesome clinician. Other days I'm like, I'm doing okay, I'm doing okay. So there's some harmony. So really, I, I really um, pose this to all trainees and even my colleagues that it's not a seesaw of balance of uh, balancing act, it's more of a harmony. like utilizing my spouse to help with the support in the home of being an awesome mother or what an awesome mother looks like on a random Tuesday or a random Friday at the last day of school when they're running out the house to go to play kickball. Um, so just utilizing your support so that it can be harmonious and knowing that 100% uh, does not look like 100% each and every day. That's fantastic um, and so honest. So thank you for that, um, your willingness to, to share that. Uh, Dr. Benson, can you talk a little bit about um, some advice or wisdom you have about folks who may be wanting to take a gap year before they consider um, going on to be an MD, uh, PhD candidate, and also maybe um, help folks who have an interest in research and are still trying to decide between the MD or the PhD route or the combined uh, medical, uh, MD, PhD, uh, degrees. Well, uh, thank you, Marguerite. No, I'm, I'm a big proponent of gap years. I, I think that they're great. Um, I used my gap year to work as a research assistant and I studied for that year. So it helped me, it, it helped to solidify my interest in, in research. Um, it was basic science research, but I turned that into clinical research. However, I would suggest um, uh, using the gap year to like travel overseas, do a medical mission someplace or do something really exciting, learn a foreign language. Um, when I was at um, Harvard doing my residency, I found that a lot of the medical students there had done gap years and they did these really interesting things that uh, actually uh, made for great um, personal statements um, in their applications. So I think that it's a great time after you finish undergraduate school, if you're not sure if you wanna do medical school or uh, do graduate school uh, to sort that thing out, to sort of um, make yourself more prepared uh, as you go back as well. I think you're more settled when you start. Uh, I think I would have been tired if I had gone just from undergrad to medical school to try to go through as well. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. Um... And uh, Dr. Jones, can you talk a little bit about maybe giving some advice for people who have an interest in giving back to their HBCUs and how, um, how you can have your own career, but still give back to maybe not just your HBCU, but other HBCUs, um, either in your area or the ones that you graduated from? 
Absolutely. Uh, and something that I always say is, you know, if, if it wasn't for my attendance at Virginia State University and my training there, I do not think I would have had the courage to go on to become that first African-American to earn the PhD that I received at Florida State University and for a lot of the other achievements that came along the way. And actually the first um, HBCU that I worked with under the brand of Hey Dr. Tay when I brought the STEM excitement to students was with the upper Upward Bound students at Hampton University, just to let you all know. <laughs> so, but I, I love, love, love the opportunities of going back to HBCUs is specifically to talk to the students. One, because it allows them to have that career exposure. And two, it allows them to ask someone that has literally stepped in similar shoes as they are stepping in now and walking similar paths to kind of figure out how to navigate that system, that journey, and the resources that are available to them and where to find those things. So, you know, just, I, I am often talk, well, welcomed to some, giving some talks at certain HBCUs, but I also wanna encourage those who are here, if you are in charge of programs, departments, or whatever else, if you please just send us an a email and ask for us to come out to your schools in whatever capacity, maybe you wanna learn about a grant mechanism or you wanna learn about how to become you know, more efficient at getting funding at your institute. Talk, we are the right people to talk to. We've not only been there and done that, we're working in the particular departments that with, at, with other individuals that you would wanna get in touch with. So I welcome those questions and those inquiries um, to come our way, especially. That's awesome. All you have to do is open your mouth and ask. And in the words of Dr. Sadana Jackson, who says this to me and other colleagues at least once a week, you have not because you ask not. So uh, you'd be surprised what people are willing to, to do for you. Um, Dr. Washington, ooh, I am so um, appreciative of the history you have shared and your um, all of the, the things that you have seen. Can you talk um, a little bit about ways that people can um, approach perhaps, you know, working at NIH or somewhere else, even when they think maybe it's not as diverse, like maybe this is the most diversity they've seen of people working at NIH. Can you just give some maybe tips about how people can go about entering spaces, maybe where they're not um, a lot of people who look like them, but still, you know, maybe making a way for themselves um, in that area? Sure, um, my pleasure. The, the thing is, I, I think you have to develop in your mind that, you're gonna persevere. And to piggyback on what you just said, you have not because you asked not Dr. Jackson, Dr. Matthews, you got to get out there and just make it happen. Um, and going through Jackson State, matriculating through that, set the foundation. It set me on a trajectory so that I could do that against all odds. You know, there's a, there's a part in the movie, one of the Star Wars movies where Han Solo tells, I think three CPO, Never tell me the odds. <laughs> He's trying to escape something. He's trying to get away. And this guy's telling him, hey, you can't win this. Never tell me the odds. Always keep in mind that, that you're going to run faster. You're going to jump higher. And you can do this. When I came to the NIH, the panel that, that's before us, it didn't exist 22 years ago. In fact, when I came to NINDS, there were, uh, I think, one. Black extramural scientists, one. And then came Dr. Jett, <laughs> Dr. Jones London, Dr. Benson, and the rest of you guys came on board. And as the old head here, it does me proud to see such genius before me. I thought I would never see this in my career at the NIH. We've come so, so far. And as I showed the picture of Dr. King in 66, we still have a long way to go, but I see progress. And so I, I hope that this has been encouraging to all of you that against all odds, you persevere and continue to strive for excellence and do, and you will succeed. Awesome, thank you. That is like the perfect way to end this panel. Like there's nothing left to be said. A great way to kick off Juneteenth weekend. Uh, Dr. Jackson, if you'd be so kind as to drop uh, the Eventbrite link for a Juneteenth event that folks can participate in, and I will turn it over to Dr. Jett to close us out. Uh, I agree. This has been a remarkable experience for me. And, um, you know, the, the thing that I think is, is most, I'm most impressed 
about is what we have done here at NINDS in terms of um, hiring people from that are products of HBCUs. Um, I don't know the actual data to make this comment, but we have, I, I think a lot have, have, have done a lot in that space here. And I'm so proud of our Institute. Um, and the one thing that I message that I want to leave you with is um, one that you've heard before. And that is, if you want to know more, if you want some advice, we're here and please, you know, reach out to us. So thanks for all the speakers. Thank you all this, just a remarkable job. And thanks to everyone on this uh, webinar for listening. Have a great weekend, have a great Father's Day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, happy Juneteenth. Yep, happy Juneteenth.